very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Hilary Tomasowitz tonight. Um, she and I have known each other for almost 10 years now um, since she was a sub I when I was a intern uh, in the Department of Neurosurgery at Cornell. Um, Dr. Tomasowitz started her medical career at Sinai doing her MD and PhD here. Uh, prior to joining us at Cornell, um, we were residents together and then coming back here after a fellowship in functional and stereotactic neurosurgery at Emory University uh, under the tutelage of Dr. Bob Gross. Um, she has extensive training in um, every form of functional neurosurgery, including epilepsy and um, pain management and all the modern techniques you can think of and not think of for managing these important disorders that we don't always think of necessarily as neurosurgical. Um, and tonight's talk is going to focus on one of those areas that is often ignored by the neurosurgeon, but probably affects more patients than most neurosurgical disorders uh, affect. So it's really critically important to think about and a great thing for you all to learn about tonight. So welcome, Dr. Tomasowitz. I'll give you this. Thanks. Story. Thank you, Pete. And hi, everybody. Welcome. Let me try to share my screen without doing something crazy. Hang on. Um, I've already done something crazy. Yeah. I did, I did test this. See, why can't I um, see my see Zoom anymore? This is very strange. Hang on one second. Something bad happened. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just lost my, I lost, do I just share screen now? But I, I don't mm -hmm. see my screen now. So I'm going to leave and rejoin if that's okay. Can I do that? Uh, yeah. Let, let me see if I can invite you to share your screen. Yeah. I just, I just see, um, I just see the thumbnail pictures of folks. Oh, you don't see your control panel? No, I don't. Okay. If you want to sign on, sign back in. That's fine. Yeah, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do that real quick. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay, perfect. All right. Let's see. Share screen. Can you guys see my screen? We can. Pete, good. Okay. Well, Pete, thank you so much. I'm gonna to try to kind of not fly through this, but be efficient because it is 7.30 and I know people probably don't want to be learning about pain all night, but um, I'm going to talk to you today a bit about um, some of the tools in our armatarium that we have for um, managing pain from a neurosurgical standpoint. So as Pete said, I'm currently a stereotactic functional neurosurgeon who joined Sinai late last year. Uh, and I was really fortunate to do my fellowship at Emory University where I was, um, I was exposed and gained a lot of experience with some of the techniques I'm going to talk about you guys, uh, talk with you about today. And you know, I'm going to be giving a very brief overview of some of the neurosurgical techniques we have available um, for the management of intractable cancer pain. And you know, importantly, just kind of keep in mind, as Peter alluded to, um, many of these techniques I think are grossly, vastly underutilized um, for reasons we're going to get to at the, at the end of my talk. So I'm going to first go over some general. Um, background regarding different types of pain. And then I'm going to briefly go over the indications for and some of the data supporting several neuromodulatory and neuroablative techniques available that are to, uh, that help can help patients with refractory cancer pain. What I've done here is I've, you can see that I've listed most of the procedures that we have available to us um, on this slide under their associated indication. And unfortunately, we don't have enough time to discuss sort of the full breadth of these ablative procedures that I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to discuss several of these. In the um, category of neuromodulation for pain, we're going to discuss spinal cord stimulation and intrathecal drug delivery. Um, in terms of patients with unilateral somatic nociceptive neuropathic body cancer pain, we're going to talk about chordotomy. Patients ex who experience midline subdiaphragmatic visceral cancer pain, we're going to talk about midline myotomy. And for disseminated cancer pain, we're going to talk briefly about cingulotomy. Unfortunately, just time doesn't permit us to talk uh, about the treatment of craniofacial cancer pain and non-cancer pain for that matter. It's a big category and it's very interesting and it's actually would be my favorite part of this talk, but we're gonna skip it for now. So um, as you guys all know, or maybe don't, pain is one of the most common symptoms among cancer patients, um, primarily in those who suffer from advanced metastatic disease. 
And you know, despite tremendous, tremendous advances in palliative care, standard therapies really fail to achieve the desired pain relief or result in um, intolerable side effects in up to 30 to 40% of cases, cancer uh, cases. So, you know, in, in our attempts to aggressively treat cancer pain with opiates, patients frequently experience higher incidences of um, opiate toxicity. And, you know, a, a huge majority of, of patients are concerned that if they take opioids, they will develop constipation, nausea, drowsiness, confusion, addiction, all the things that kind of go with, with opiates. Um, and what, you know, what I find really interesting, and which is why kind of approaching pain from a surgical standpoint becomes relevant, is that these opiate-induced side effects can also prevent patients from taking enough medication to control their pain. And it's just really keep, important to keep in mind that, you know, side effects that we might think are minor, you know, physicians, medical students think are minor, can be major for the patients. So ultimately, then the goal for these patients with intractable pain is to achieve adequate dosing for pain relief without unmanageable or unwanted side effects. So this is just a very simplified diagram of, of um, several kind of types of pain. And in the cancer population, the vast majority of pain is nociceptive, which generally is more responsive to opiates and also more amenable to some of the destructive ablative procedures I'm going to discuss uh, shortly. Nociceptive cancer pain is caused um, most typically by irritation of the nerves, but over time it can progress to neuropathic pain when nerves actually become damaged. And this type of neuropathic pain tends to be continuous. Um, neuropathic pain is, is much more responsive to augmentative modalities based on chronic stimulation of peripheral nerves or spinal cord pathways. Again, we're gonna discuss those. And of course, and this is where it gets tricky, patients can have a mixed pain picture, which is, uh, can and often is quite difficult to treat. So defining the type of pain and choosing the right uh, type of surgical procedure are the most important determinants for success in, in any of the intervention, if, if any intervention that I'm gonna talk about and also for the prevention of uh, complications. So as I mentioned, nociceptive pain is related to noxious stimuli. It's activated in response to tissue damage or inflammation. It's usually described by patients as well-localized, throbbing, sharp. Um, it's like I mentioned, often, often, often opioid responsive. And some examples are bone invasion by tumor, soft tissue invasion by tumor. Um, uh, sort of the flip side of this, neuropathic pain is a consequence of nerve damage and is um, often caused by uh, direct tumor invasion or compress compression of nervous structures, either peripheral nerves or the spinal cord. Um, it's generally described as a constant severe burning or aching pain. It's very, very often opiate unresponsive. And our, the typical mainstays of treatment that we use for neuropathic pain uh, prior to considering surgery are, are um, pharmacologic uh, agents such as gabapentin or pregabalin. Pre and again, examples, direct tumor invasion, compression structures, and iatrogenic, iatrogenic, iatrogenic excuse me, uh, damage to nervous structures from surgical procedures. So, you know, we, a large, large, large subset of patients with cancer have pain that is refractory to multimodal non-interventional therapies, such as medications. So in this group of patients, um, interventional therapies can and should almost definitely always be considered. So first we're gonna talk about um, two neuromodulatory approaches. I'm gonna briefly discuss spinal cord stimulation and intrathecal drug delivery. And these are two modalities which are quite familiar to most neurosurgeons and are, and are most definitely part of our uh, training as residents. So these are two very well-known and established techniques to address both neuropathic and mixed pain pictures. Both procedures involve placement of either a stimulating electrode, I don't know what my mouse is, a stimulating electrode um, into the epidural space or a thin catheter into the intrathecal space for the purposes of modulating pain pathways in the spinal cord. So in the case of spinal cord stimulation, a, um, a battery or a, um, a, an implanted pulse generator um, is implanted in the flank. And in the cases of intrathecal drug delivery, it's, it's a refillable drug pump that's also in place, placed basically in a cancer patient anywhere you can safely put it, where it will stay covered by, um, by uh, cutaneous tissue. It can be tricky with the pumps in cachectic cancer patients to actually figure out where to put the pump because they come in two different sizes. They come in a 20 cc size and a 40 cc size. And um, generally, we, we like to place a 40 cc size, which is, is pretty big. So you sometimes have to get creative with where you, where you place these things, but um, they really can uh, help patients with neuropathic pain. 
So briefly, I'm going to discuss um, spinal cord stim. Like I said, this is a good, good modality to treat neuropathic pain. It's considered for patients with neuropathic upper or lower extremity pain. It can, pain can be unilateral, unilateral or bilateral. Um, and patients generally should have a greater than six month life expectancy. You are bringing them to surgery. Um, it usually is a, an inpatient stay overnight and um, you are implanting hardware. So just a little bit about spinal cord stim. It was um, developed in 1967 and it was um, spurred by the gate control theory of pain, which asserts that non-painful input closes the nerve gates to painful input, which prevents pain sensations then from traveling to the central nervous system. And so we know that conventional spinal cord stims are effective at pain relief by electrically stimulating the dorsal columns in the spinal cord. And they do that by inducing paresthesias in the painful areas. And so patients are sort of um, distracted by those paresthesias, which are not unpleasant, but it, it sort of distracts them from the pain. It sounds very basic and it, it technically is. Um, just some non-cancer indications for um, conventional spinal cord stim include things like failed back syndrome with radicular pain, chronic regional pain syndrome, peripheral neuropathy, phantom and ischemic limb pain, and intractable um, angina. Um, but for cancer pain, there are a lot of new types of spinal cord stim that are being piloted and trialed, um, and they're not based on inducing paresthesias in the, in the painful areas. Um, they are things like um, high frequency stimulation or burst stimulation or dorsal ganglion stimulation. Um, and these are being actively studied in cancer populations that are, and are, are, are proving to be quite effective at relieving some forms of neuropathic pain. Um, intrathecal drug delivery is another neuromodulatory strategy, and it should be considered in patients who have um, mixed cancer pain pictures. That's to say a mix of nociceptive and neuropathic pain. These can be used to um, address uh, patients who have diffuse or localized pain. Um, primarily, they are really, really a wonderful uh, modality for patients who have inadequate pain relief um, and are suffering from intolerable side effects of oral pain medications, mostly opiates. And you can tailor the location of the intrathecal catheter um, in your, in your uh, procedure to target where the site of the pain is. That's to say you can thread that intrathecal catheter um, up the spinal column and leave the tip in the cervical area for neck pain, the upper or mid thoracic section for chest wall pain, or lower lumbar for um, low back pain or you know, leg pain. So somewhat customizable and, and, and quite effective in many, many cases. So as I mentioned, the primary advantage of intrathecal pain therapy is a very dramatic reduction in the amount of medication that is required for pain relief because this medication is going directly into the fecal space. Um, significantly smaller doses are required than with oral or IV meds. Typically the conversion is about one to 300 and patients treated with this therapy experience vastly fewer side effects than with oral drug delivery. Um, I wanted to mention this because, you know, it's not really common knowledge, but to date, the FDA has only approved three medications um, to be delivered uh, via the intrathecal route. They are baclofen for spasticity, which we're not going to talk about, but only two medications for pain, morphine and zyconotide, which is a drug called Prealt. Both of these act in different ways. Morphine obviously um, acts the opioid receptors within the dorsal horn. Zyconotide is a non-opiate based um, calcium channel uh, inhibitor also acts in cells in the dorsal horn. But you know, it's really interesting. I'm so sorry, my phone's going off. Um, the, silence it. The, um, my training, I, Pete mentioned, we both did our residencies together at Cornell and Memorial Sloan Kettering. And you know, I, as I was putting this talk together, I realized that not, we sort of never followed the rules uh, of morphine or pre in our pumps. It was always these wild combinations of sometimes steroids, sometimes, um, it, um, uh, local anesthetics combined with dilaudid or other types of opiates. And you know, while that's totally permitted to, to, to do such sort of off-label combos, it's very, very important if you, you know, are, are interested in this kind of work to um, you know, really take the whole patient into account in terms of balancing and risks and benefits um, because the um, manufacturers and the FDA have um, studied, studied delivery of other medications, obviously in preclinical models, and you know, there's been pump failures, dosing errors, things like that. So important to remember, there's only two pain medications that are approved, but you can get creative, especially with patients with, with um, complex pain pictures. 
So I'm just going to breeze through this, but basically there was a, a big cancer pain trial in 2002 that was an international multi-center randomized control, controlled clinical trial designed to evaluate the effectiveness of intrathecal drug delivery versus comprehensive medical management alone for patients with persistent cancer pain. They looked at outcomes of pain and they looked at opiate side effects. They also looked at secondary outcomes, including changes in quality of life, changes in caregiver quality of life, cost of care and survival. It's kind of a busy slide, but the upshot is that four-week data showed very significant improvements for patients treated with intrathecal therapy uh, over those receiving um, medical management alone. And so their, their pain, you guys have all seen this, I'm sure, and showed it to, to patients, but this is the visual analog pain scale. And um, patients with intrathecal medications had a much bigger reduction in their VAS scores, although it actually wasn't significant in this study. But what was very, very significant was their composite toxicity scores. All of the measured toxicities that could be attributed to opiates and other drugs that were used in pain therapy, typically through oral or IV routes, were dramatically reduced in the intrathecal group. And additionally, and very importantly for patients with limited um, you know, life duration left, there were significantly larger reductions in fatigue and reduced consciousness um, for the intrathecal group. So great, great modality um, to consider in patients with mixed pain pictures. So I talked very fast and, and I'm sorry I talked so fast, let's just have a talk. Um, we talked about two uh, neuromodulatory strategies for, for pain control in the cancer population. I'm going to discuss now um, a couple of neuroablative strategies that have been shown to be very effective in treating cancer pain that, that are definitely not as familiar to most neurosurgeons. And, you know, I didn't come across these at all, actually, in my residency training, only when I got to actually one, I saw one chordotomy, but this was all, this was all fellowship experience um, where I became familiar and uh, proficient with, with these procedures. So I'm going to start with a case. Um, this is a 49-year-old guy who's got mesothelioma, and he develops unremitting chest wall pain on the affected side. He's gotten limited pain relief with opiates and adjuvant therapies, and he has a less than six-month life expectancy. So just based on what I told you about the neuromodulatory strategies, spinal cord stim could be considered, but this guy doesn't have many, many months left. IT drug delivery? Maybe. We're going to talk about chordotomy. Obviously, the answer is going to be C in this case. So well, chordotomy is a, a procedure that should be considered for patients who suffer from localized pain below the C4 dermatome. Um, and this is a procedure that um, disconnects the nociceptive pathways traveling in the spinothalamic tract. This procedure is preferred especially for the treatment of nociceptive and tractable pain and malignancy, and it's performed in the awake patient using needle electrodes with the help of real-time CT imaging. So the target for um, chordotomy is the lateral, lateral spinothalamic tract, which is shown here. You can see a cannula in it, uh, which is located in the anterolateral part of the spinal cord. And we know, and you guys know, that this ascending tract carries information chiefly about superficial and deep pain and temperature and relays some tactile information. And because most fibers in this system decussate over two to five segments before entering the interlateral columns, chordotomy aims to interrupt the spinothalamic tract ascending contralaterally to the painful side. So that means if the pain is on the right below the C4 dermatome, your, your chordotomy target for this lateral spinothalamic tract is gonna be on the left. And as you guys also know, probably you have studied this more recently than I have, that these fibers in this tract are arranged somatotopically, which allows us the opportunity as surgeons to perform selective chordotomies, given that if you make a more anteromedial lesion, you're going to denervate the contralateral arm and upper chest region, while posterior lateral lesions are going to denerv denervate sacral and lumbar areas. So in terms of the procedure, the patient is uh, positioned supine and um, they need to be infused with intrathecal contrast. And usually that's via a lumbar puncture prior to the procedure. However, if the general condition of the patient um, doesn't permit lumbar puncture, often it does not in reality, you can inject contrast material um, during the procedure at the C12 level. So it's a high cervical puncture. Um, after you inject that local anesthetic agent up here, the, and I think we will get to it. It's a, I'll, I'll talk about the approach in a second. I just forgot what slide that was on. Um, the chordotomy needle is inserted inferior to the mastoid process in a vertical plane perpendicular to the axis of the spinal cord. 
And so the ideal placement of this needle is initially just in the anterolateral part of the dura of the upper spinal cord. And as you advance the cannula needle, you get new thin cut CT slices taken to determine the exact localization of the tip. And it's important to keep in mind, especially in some cancer patients who have had head and neck radiation, the dura in these cases can be super thick and super difficult to puncture. And it can be, it can be very challenging because it's a balance between you know, having to puncture that dura, but not wanting to, to, to basically you know, spear their spinal cord. So using CT, it's iterative small movements to get through that dura. And after you proper, properly localize your cannula tip um, inside the dura, you insert a, a straight or a curved electrode through that cannula tip. And then the most important part of the procedure happens. We use neurophysiological confirmation via impedance measurements, and we do alter, alter, alternate, alter, alternate that with that. Sorry, you guys, I'm having a problem today uh, with, with stimulation. And that's how we confirm the functional response of the target. So impedance measurements, as I said, are taken to identify where we are in the spinal cord, because this is, this is blind. This is a patient laying on a CT scanner bed, immobilized, but awake, and you are blindly inserting this needle into a very tiny tract in the spinal cord. So we use these impedance measurements to figure out where we are. And I have them listed here, basically. So if your impedance is 100 to 200 ohms, you know your tip's still in the CSF. It increases a little bit, okay, you're making contact with the spinal cord. Uh, is the dura rather. And then once the cord is actually penetrated, you get this big impedance jump and then you know that you're in the cord and you obviously every time, every tiny sub, you know, sub centimeter uh, advancement is confirmed with CT in real time. So again, just to stress the target in cordotomy is this lateral spinothalamic tract. And the ideal localization of this electrode tip once you're, once you're set will be one millimeter anterior to the dentate ligament for lumbosacral fibers and two to three millimeters anterior of, to the dentate ligament for thoracic and cervical fibers. And you know, again, this morphological appearance has to be confirmed by not only real-time CT imaging, but by stimulation, um, which requires the patient obviously to be awake and cooperative at this point. So once you're happy and you're, you're satisfied radiographically that your electrode tip is in the spinal cord, you, we start to initiate stimulation. And that is done at very minimal voltage values. We first stimulate at you know, between two to five hertz at a very low voltage. And what we're looking for is ipsilateral trapezius muscle contraction. And that indicates that the electrode is within or near the anterior gray matter. If we get ipsilateral actual motor responses of the arm or leg, we know we're not in the right spot. That, that tells us we're in the corticospinal tract and that is not our target for this procedure to, to relieve pain. That would, that would take out motor. So we know we're in the wrong spot. So then you can adjust and you know it's iterative. You can pull that needle out, you can start again. But once we're confident we're not in the corticospinal tract, we increase the frequency of the stimulation. And what we're looking for then in an awake patient, we wanna cause pain, paresthesias and warmth. Um, in the area of their pain. And that's when we know that we are in the spinothalamic tract and that's the target. So obviously the most critical part of this procedure, you know, after getting your needle in the right place and your electrode in the right place is the, stimu is the stimulation step. So if you, if, a, if about a hundred Hertz um, stimulation gives a response at a low voltage, it indicates that you're in the right place and you're at, you're at your target. Um, you know, and then, as I said, we can be selective about this lesioning. So the response from stimulation from specific parts of the lateral spinothalamic tract usually corresponds to destruction of the selected part of that tract. So we only can perform a selective chordotomy, i.e. anterior, anterior meal for arm or posterior lateral for leg, if we get a stimulation response that overlies the patient's painful area. So once we're, we've nailed it, which we always do, um, we monitor the energy and the tip temperature throughout um, the, the, the procedure. And both are gradually increased with the energy and the tip temperature. What we do is we slowly ramp up that energy and the temperature and we can create a permanent lesion um, at a tip temperature of around 60 degrees with a 30 second lesion. So we make generally three of these lesions and after each lesion, we, we test the patient, we test motor function, we test pain perception and we test discrimination of hot and cold sensations. Um, typically, we, like I said, we make a maximum of three lesions for unilateral cordotomy and the final lesion is usually made at a little bit of a higher temperature, 70 to 80, 80 degrees Celsius for 60 seconds. 
So this procedure is great because patients are awake. You know, you just pull your needle out, put a, put a bandaid on, clean it up a little bit. Their patients go right to the ICU. Their vital signs are monitored, um, and you know, if they are, they meet, you know, but uh, criteria and their vital signs stay stable, they can actually go home five or six hours after the procedure, which is which is pretty fantastic. So it's quite minimally invasive. Um, I wanted to talk very briefly that, you know, that you'll note the dates on these are kind of old studies, but they are the two big seminal studies that have shown that this percutaneous CT guided cordotomy is um, very safe and effective for the treatment of refractory cancer pain. So first, just quickly, Raslin did a, um, a study in 2008 where 51 patients with cancer related face or body pain were treated with CT guided cordotomy. He also did a trigeminal tractotomy for facial pain, which is one of the procedures I'm not gonna talk about. But 41 of these patients underwent unilateral cervical cordotomy, the procedure I just uh, explained. And they assessed their pain uh, outcomes using the degree of pain relief uh, based on the visual analog scale. There's a scale I just showed you with the happy faces and the sad faces and total sleeping hours. Um, they also used uh, the Karnofsky scale to um, measure the patient's level of pre and post cordotomy um, function. So just quickly, after surgical intervention, there's a lot of numbers here, um, patients reported both initial, immediate post-operative and six-month follow-up pain as 98% and 80% respectively. Uh, very importantly, um, minimal complications were noted in these patients. There was transient hypotension, as you can imagine, you're poking around in the spinal cord, it can be um, it can be a little bit. Um, uh, what's the word I want? I can't quite think of it. Um, there are other tracts and other important structures there that can be transiently affected by your lesioning. A couple of patients had headaches; they went away. Sleep apnea was not an issue in this in this series, and uh, no patient had motor changes, which is excellent because that would say suggest that they were in this, the wrong tract, the, the cortical spinal tract. Uh, this is a bigger study that um, was performed. Uh, 207 cordotomies were performed, performed between 87 and 2007. All of these patients had intractable cancer pain uh, related to malignancy. And again, they looked at um, pain scores and Karnofsky performance scale. And in this study, they um, found that the initial success rate post-procedure was 92.5%, and it, and it was higher uh, compared to a separate study where the patients um, underwent the same procedure for non-cancer pain. So in the cancer group, the selective cordotomy um, was achieved in 83%, where they were able to target just an arm, just a leg um, on, on either side, depending on where the patient's pain syndrome uh, originated. Um, again, minimal complications. Um, one patient had permanent seizures, which a lot of patients surprisingly are okay with um, because they, they still have significant relief of their primary pain. And again, transient motor weakness and transient ataxia in, in the rest of the group. Um, I was super excited to find this study. You notice that those are quite old studies, but in 2019, a randomized controlled trial um, was conducted to actually assess whether cordotomy and pain outcomes in opti uh, like optimally man medically treated patients uh, with refractory cancer pain. So these guys, these authors hypothesized that cordotomy would improve pain intensity in patients who have refractory cancer pain um, who were already being managed by specialist driven palliative care teams. So these were beautifully managed, high level um, palliative care treated patients. And they wanted to see if adding cordotomy onto that could improve pain intensity in these patients. So they recruited patients with refractory unilateral somatic body pain, which is the indication for cordotomy. You'll remember from the beginning of the talk. Um, and these patients, importantly, had to have already had three palliative care evaluations. Patients were randomized to either cordotomy or continued interdisciplinary palliative care. And in this study, the primary outcome was a 33% improvement in pain intensity at one week after cordotomy, um, as measured by a couple of different um, outcome scales, which I'm not going to get into. But uh, a total of 16 patients were enrolled. Six of the seven patients who were randomized to cordotomy, that's 86%, uh, did experience this greater than 33% reduction in their pain intensity scores one week after cordotomy. Zero of the nine patients who were randomized to palliative care only achieved this reduction. So it goes without saying that seven of these patients who were randomized to palliative care elected to then to undergo cordotomy after a week and then all of those seven patients had the same um, significant reduction in their pain intensity scores. So again, complications were minimal, nothing was, um, nothing was permanent. 
And, um, you know, there was an immediate benefit conferred to the, the, these patients. Um, and there's, you know, chordotomy is very beneficial because there's the ability to perform this intervention and in, even in the very advanced stages of disease. Um, and I wanted to mention too, that chordotomy can be repeated if pain recurs. So here's another case. This is a 35 year old woman with melanoma. She presented with a three month history of progressive right hip and leg pain. Um, she's been unable to walk for the past week. So she did undergo a uh, chordotomy. You can see the needle on the contralateral side here, here at the dura, here at the, end, the entrance of the cord and here in the lateral spinothalamic tract. Sorry, I'm, I'm on, on the wrong screen. Um, and after this procedure, she had no hip pain, which is fantastic. She was able to actually walk unassisted to the bathroom. She was able to start weaning off opioids, but she did unfortunately start reporting a headache uh, that had been masked by her significant pain. And they unfortunately scanned her and she had a big, big net in her brain, but um, the, chordo the chordotomy got her back on her feet and off opiates and the brain that was addressed. Uh, second case is this is a 35 year old guy who's diagnosed with melanoma a long time ago. He was maximally treated by the surgical team and the melanoma team, but he ended up coming back in um, a couple of years later with these horrible uh, fungating tumors. And just, you can imagine unremitting pain in his right lower extremity. So he also underwent chordotomy. And you can actually see here, this is what that lesion looks like post-op on MRI. You can see a, a nice ablation in the area of the lateral spinothalamic tract. But he also had a great outcome. He went to home hospice and he died peacefully and pain-free a week later. So it's a, it's a really great procedure that absolutely um, is considered in, in a, a lot of cancer hospitals, but is not as familiar to uh, neurosurgeons who are practicing in you know, ter tertiary um, hospitals where the, um, the cancer crew might not be as strong. So very, very briefly, I'm gonna now discuss um, percutaneous CT guided midline myelotomy. And this technique already after hearing my spiel about chordotomy is gonna be very familiar to you because it's very, very similar, but the indications for it, as well as the spinal cord pathway it targets do differ. So it's, it's, it's worth um, mentioning. To start with sort of a general case, um, a 63 year old guy presents, he's got a history of metastatic rectal adenocarcinoma. He has progressive pelvic and sacral pain, deep pelvic sacral pain. And again, limited pain relief with oral and intrathecal opiates. So this gentleman had already undergone placement of an intrathecal drug pump and, and it was still not helping him. These patients can be very, very difficult to treat. So spinal cord stem, maybe, uh, chordotomy, eh, pelvic pain we're talking about. It's not unilateral somatic body pain. He's, we're talking bilateral sort of visceral pain. So midline myelotomy would be something to consider for this gentleman. And again, very similar technically to chordotomy, but different indications and different target. So midline myelotomy um, involves partially, partially lesioning the spinal cord in the midline. You can see that here. And your target is to interrupt the ascending fibers of the postsynaptic uh, dorsal column pathway in the medial most aspect of the spinal cord, uh, of, the, of the dorsal columns. So this is a postsynaptic pathway that we know plays a very important role in spinothalamic tract visceral signal transmission. And so myelotomy is generally used for otherwise intractable um, cancer pain causing um, abdominal pain, pelvic pain, sacral pain, things like that. And while myelotomy like chordotomy can be done in an open fashion, it, there's a pretty high morbidity associated with doing these things open. So again, these percutaneous CT guided approaches are minimally invasive and they obviously very, very vastly um, less disturb the spinal cord anatomy because you, you're doing it under real-time guidance and you're using a, a needle instead of opening dura, you know, retracting blood everywhere. Um, so they're, they're great techniques. Um, and again, they can be done under local anesthesia and a, a very short hospital stay. Um, the positioning is different. So one of the key differences is uh, the positioning is different. Patients for this procedure um, are placed prone because the entry point in contrast to chordotomy is at the midline at the junction between the skull base and C1. And you can see that needle here. So very, very high cervical, the uh, occipital cervical junction. Again, the needle is slowly advanced under these iterative CT scans until it reaches the dura. Just as in chordotomy, we take impedance measurements um, as the needle advances and the cord to confirm the cord is penetrative. And again, patients ideally should be awake and cooperative because we do need this feedback from stimulation. Um, so just to reinforce the target here, as I said, was the extra pain system that ascends in the medial most aspects of the dorsal columns. 
an ideal electrode placement is just posterior to the um, center of the spinal cord and just anterior to the dorsal funiculus, so here. Um, again, real-time CT guidance, and um, again, as in chordotomy, stimulation is critical, critical, critical to be assured that you're in the right anatomic location. So what you're looking for here, I, you may recall that in chordotomy, you're looking for ipsilateral trapezius contraction. Here, what you're looking for with stimulation is paresthesias of the distal lower extremities, so lower extremities uh, and, and feet paresthesias. And once you're con you've confirmed that with low voltage, um, you, we generally make two lesions in this pathway at a little bit higher temperature, 70 to 80 degrees for 60 seconds each. Um, there have been no randomized control trials of percutaneous CT guide in myelotomy, but this is a series, again, by Campolette, who's kind of a pioneer um, in the field, that was published, uh, this is late 90s, that showed that um, a majority of patients, 11 to 15, ha had either total or satisfactory pain relief and no complications after undergoing this percutaneous midline myelotomy. Um, in terms, there have been lots of series published, um, no, no randomized controlled trials, obviously, and these are much more recent. Um, and you know what they kind of taken together uh, report is that most patients achieved um, either a significant reduction or a complete cessation of opioid intake after midline myelotomy. We know that um, pain also can recur, but some of these studies showed that pain recurred um, in an, a different area at distant sites, and it was often due, due to disease progression. So again, you can repeat this procedure um, often with good effect. Um, the most common side effects were a small risk of urinary retention, proprioceptive loss because you're in the dorsal columns, transient paresthesias and weakness. And very interestingly for weakness, um, patients didn't, again, it was, it was a trade-off. You know, weakness wasn't as functionally limiting in these patients as, as a, a, a normal patient because most of these patients were already bed bound from their pain. So it was a, it was a trade-off that they were willing to, um, to make uh, to, to get a, a significant amount of pain relief. And I think that was just the last point there. Perfect. Um, so just a case, this is a 46 year old woman. She had metastatic melanoma and she had um, multiple small bowel metastases. She was admitted with increasing abdominal pain that was refractory to medication and had been transferred to the ICU for pain control. And they had actually started a Presidex infusion because her pain was just unremitting. So she underwent my lot midline myelotomy, CT guided percutaneous, and they were able to get her off that Presidex and transfer her to regular care and begin adjuvant treatment for her primary cancer the next day. Okay, so we've discussed two percutaneous ablative spinal cord stimulation, uh, spinal cord uh, procedures for uh, cancer pain. We now are going to shift over to um, a, one of the ablative strategies to, to, to treat a diffuse kind of a diffuse pain picture in cancer pain patients. And that I know sounds a little wacky, but it's gonna get clear in a second. Um, so we know obviously that there are the patients that suffer from wide pen, widespread pain syndromes, um, as well as those that have a very significant psychological component to their pain. Um, and those are patients who may not be appropriate for things like percutaneous chordotomy or percutaneous midline myelotomy. For these patients, um, cingulotomy can be considered. And we're gonna talk briefly about that. So we know that all pain interventions um, basically uh, focus on the somatosensory system. And um, pain, however, is a very, very complex uh, experience um, that patients have. And there are sensory discriminative, emotional, motivational, and behavioral components. And we also know that there are these feedback loops between pain, emotions, and cognition. And that pain can have a negative effect on emotions and on cognitive function. And conversely, a negative emotional state can lead to increased pain whereas a positive emotional state can reduce pain. Um, you know, very similarly, cognitive states such as attention and memory can either increase or decrease pain. So it's a complex circuit. And the reason it's a complex circuit um, is that pain activates multiple brain areas that form part of these distributed networks, right? And so I have a figure here that I really like that sort of highlights the cingulate cortex here, anterior cingulate cortex. And we know that this is a major, major hub in many of these networks, these um, distributed pain networks and it has a critical role in several aspects of pain processing. We know that afferent nociceptive information, pain information, enters the brain from the spinal cord via the thalamus and is projected to the insula, the anterior cingulate, um, the primary somatosensory cortex and secondary somatosensory cortex. And this is a, the pain pathway shown in gray over here. 
we know from human MRI studies that um, emotional and cognitive responses to pain primarily involve this anterior cingulate, um, dorsal, the dorsal region of the anterior cingulate, if you want to be specific, which is part of the limbic circuit. And it's known to have a major, major role in cognitive and emotional processing of pain, as well as the, as the, as the perception of pain. So we know that the anterior cingulate modulates these descending pain, uh, the descending pain pathways via inputs to the periaqueductal gray, which are conveyed um, to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord via the rostroventral medulla, and this pathway is shown in green. So, you know, really interestingly, I think it's been shown that if you can alter the mood state, um, you can alter the perceived unpleasantness of the pain without actually altering the intensity of the pain sensation itself, because emotions activate the circuitry. Um, and so, you know, this was sort of the basis for the cingulate cortex uh, becoming a target for both neuromodulatory strategies such as DVS, which we're not going to talk about, uh, but also neuroablative strategy, uh, strategies, which we are going to talk about. So, um, you know, studies of cingulotomy for intractable cancer pain have demonstrated that this is, procedure is highly effective for diffuse pain syndromes for certain head and neck malignancies or from, for patients that suffer from significant emotional distress from their pain. And we know that um, you know, there's been several reports that have described the effectiveness of cingulotomy in treating refractory cancer pain, but really, really, really the, the kind of the role of this procedure in today's framework for the management of cancer pain is not well understood. Your average oncologist is not gonna call you with a consult and say like, hey, I have a patient that would be appropriate for cingulotomy. So it's, it's really about educating the palliative care doctors, um, edu educating the primary team doctors, the medicine doctors, that some of these procedures are available for their patients that, they, that they've never heard of potentially. Um, what it is basically is you are targeting, and I can show the cingulum bundle here, there's a big tract of white matter fibers, and cingulotomy involves, as it sounds like, ablating, selectively ablating these fibers that pass through the um, dorsal anterior cingulate via this cingulum bundle right here. So patients, um, again, that suffer from diffuse pain syndrome, significant psychological components of their pain, or certain head and neck malignancies respond very well to this procedure. Um, meds can be tapered quickly. Patients can be discharged the next day. There are complications, obviously. You're sticking a, you know, a, a a radio frequency probe in someone's head and, and, burn, and burning their brain. So seizures have been reported, they're rare. Um, temporary confusion has been reported that most of the time resolves and the bleeding obviously is um, more rare these days because we do these um, stereotactically under, under guidance, often um, interventional MRI, real-time guidance. So, um, you know, it, it's just, a, I wanna convey to you that in a very carefully selected subset of uh, refractory cancer pain patients, um, there is really good evidence and increasing evidence that a stereotactic anterior cingulotomy is, a, is an effective option. So this is, a, I thought, a cool, pretty recent study, um, but uh, this is a group out of Israel um, who, basically did a recent, recent respective review of double stereotactic cingulotomy for cancer pain. And he studied patients with uh, metastatic cancer with a prognosis of greater than a year. And you can see those double stereotactic lesions here in uh, axial, coronal, and sagittal views, again, targeting that dorsal anterior cingulate. Um, all these patients reported um, immediate relief and at one month um, post-op where their visual analog scores decreased from nine to four. And for the patients we, they had follow-up on, uh, which was about 80% of the patients that were available for follow-up, they reported substantial pain relief at one to three months as well. Um, interestingly, out of the six patients that who happened to be preoperatively bedridden, three of them were walking after, which is pretty cool. And um, the neuropsych analyses of six of these patients showed that their cognitive functions remained stable, although there was a very mild, non-significant decrease in focused attention. As you might expect you're targeting a region that's involved in um, attention perception um, as well as, emo as emotion. So they did, there were some declines in attention. Adverse effects here, uh, there was no major morbidity or mortality, but uh, again, transient confusion and mild apathy, which lasted from one to four weeks. So this was a pretty neat study um, that concluded that double stereotactic cingulotomy um, was safe and effective in, allevi in alleviating um, a certain subset of patients' uh, refractory cancer pain without really hurting them, which is, which is very cool. 
So we talked briefly, I really like this chart because it provides kind of an algorithm for, for providers, but we talked about several surgical interventions that have been used to safely and effectively treat intractable oncologic pain. And again, this is a, is a neat figure that helps clinicians kind of select what the most appropriate uh, neuroablative procedure for a given pain syndrome might be. Use it, you know, use it in their clinical practice when they, when they have patients who fall into some of these buckets. So today I focused on several of these techniques, obviously, but I didn't have time to discuss all. And um, the ones I omitted are not as commonly performed. So I tried to talk about the ones that I obviously have the most experience with. So in the cases, just to recap, in the cases of localized pain, um, we can have, we consider disconnection procedures. Um, they can have great benefits such as cordotomy or myelotomy. Um, and in cases of diffuse pain with emotional distress or head and neck pain, cingulotomy is, is a really uh, a good uh, modality to consider. So just to recap, um, again, neurosurgery for cancer pain, it's not, uh, it's not really something that too many neurosurgeons know too much about, but there are really brilliant people doing brilliant work um, literally across the world, kind of trying to make these uh, procedures better, safer, and, and really educate, again, the, um, the inpatient side of the medicine teams that these are available. But we know that they can be highly effective in address addressing cancer pain. They're minimally invasive. They, they can be done on an ambulatory basis or a short stay inpatient basis. They have a very favorable risk benefit profile. And really most importantly, they result in um, increased quality of life um, at the end of life, um, which for a cancer patient is, 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 can be really, really meaningful. The big, big, big challenge as I've continually harped on is really getting offering these, you know, being able to offer these procedures to our patients in a timely way. And, and part of that is our job as neurosurgeons, neurosurgeons is, is educating the palliative, palliative care doctors that, that we have these tools and they are available and that they're safe and effective. So, you know, again, and this kind of speaks to why sometimes we don't get referrals in a timely way. It can be really, really challenging to decide when a patient is an appropriate candidate for one of these interventions. You know, a lot of questions arise. What is intractable pain? When does the patient qualify for surgery? What therapeutic approaches should they have tried first? Um, you know, given that these patients are often at the very end stage of their disease process and quite sick, how does this affect their performance status and their fitness for surgery? Um, but I found a really kind of good framework and the general consensus is to use these kind of selection criteria, which I'm gonna go over quickly right now, that specify five domains, which should be satisfied prior to considering a patient for one of these uh, procedures. Patients should have advanced oncologic disease with limited life expectancy. All options for radiotherapy should have been exhausted. Um, best medical treatments either should have failed to cause pain relief or have um, resulted in the development of intolerable side effects for the patient, i.e. opiate toxicity. Um, pain has failed to respond adequately to any more uh, straightforward, simple targeted interventions such as nerve blocks. And obviously there should be, uh, we should minimize or make absent um, the technical limitations or medical contraindications to the procedures offered. So I don't know if any of you guys are going to CNS, but I'm moderating a panel um, and a lot of these authors of the studies I've talked about are on my panel and we're gonna be really taking a deep dive into some of these ablative procedures. Um, and the, the, the panel is actually based on guidelines that the CNS puts out um, with levels of evidence of, of data and a really nice, um, it's a really nice paper on the evidence for and the outcomes and efficacy of, of all of these ablative techniques, um, some of which I've discussed today. Thank you guys. I, I, the time is, I hope it didn't go terribly over and um, I'll take any questions. And also please feel free to email me offline if you, if you, uh, you know, would, would rather talk privately. Hi, Dr. One question. Oh, how, how do I see you guys? Go ahead. All right, there we go. Now I can see one you. Quick, Hi. One quick question for you. Hi, Hi. Dr. Tomasiowicz. Uh, Thanks so you? much for the... Pretty good, pretty good. Good. Thanks so much for the great talk. Um, Where are you from? Uh, well, uh, Chicago. Wonderful, wonderful. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm a I'm a research fellow working at uh, Loyola Medical Center, Chicago. Nice. Nice. Yes. Awesome. Uh, thank you for the great talk. A wonderful overview of you know uh, these uh, I guess rarely discussed uh, treatment options, especially <laughs> surgical options for 
uh, cancer treatment. Yeah. Yeah. I was really curious. I mean, you said this already, but um, you mentioned um, intrathecal therapy for uh, cancer treatment. You said the FDA uh, has only approved two drugs. It was baclofen and what was the other one? So it's three drugs, actually. It's baclofen for spasticity and for pain, for pain um, control. I, I did say two drugs. It's morphine and a drug called ziconotide, which is probably better known by pain doctors by its, um, its trade name, which is pre-alt. Those, those are the two drugs that are that are uh, approved in this country. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah, You're it's so uh, it's surprising. Yeah, it's, it, there's only three. I, I didn't even I didn't even realize that. You know what? I was surprised too because uh, you rarely just see those drugs <laughs> in pumps. Yeah, that's fantastic. And oh, I will be going to the the CNS meeting, so I'll definitely catch your panel. Yeah, absolutely. I look forward to meeting you in person and, and having a chat. Awesome. Awesome, absolutely. Thanks so much. All right, see you there. All right, take any questions from anybody else? <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Hi, Dr. Tomaswitz. Hi, how are you, Ashley? Good, how are you? Um, this is somewhat tangential to what you were talking about because I know we didn't go into neuromodulation today. Um, but so you mentioned briefly how um, anterior cingulate neuromodulation is used for psychiatric diseases experimentally. Mm -hmm. Um, I was wondering, and that's really interesting. I didn't realize that um, that cingulotomy was done for um, pain until today. But I was wondering if um, anyone has considered neuromodulation of um, anterior cingulate or cingulate cortex. Oh, de oh, definitely. Um, um, well, I, I know Helen's target, uh, Dr. Mayberg's target, excuse me, is is subgenual cingulate. So she targets part of the cingulate cortex for depression. But actually, there's a um, there's a surgeon whose name is uh, Nicholas Boulis at um, Emory, where I train, where we're doing we're doing dorsal anterior cingulate um, bilateral stimulating electrodes. So yes, we there you know we, gosh, I have only these patients are impossible to program by the way because there's no data on how to program them. It's a high frequency, low frequency. What's the pulse width? All it's very very complicated. But absolutely, absolutely that that is a that is a target that. Um, a lot of, not a lot, very few, I should say, functional neurosurgeons are willing to, to do, not because it's technically hard, but because it's not as much of a slam dunk as your typical implantation in the STN or the GPI for a movement disorder, for example. So it, it's pretty experimental. Um, and I have to say, you know, I, I, I was assigned a, a personal patient when I, during my fellowship, and it was just it's really just sitting with the patient at trial and error, like, yeah, how do you feel? And, you know, we kind of came up with all these pain logs and try to novelly characterize his pain. And it's, it's very, very difficult. And, you know, I think it's promising. I, I will say that there is a, my best, best, best friend is a neurologist at UCSF. His name is Prasad Shavalkar. He's working with uh, Eddie Chang, who's the chairman over there. Um, and he has a really nice grant where they're looking at um, cingulate stimulation. And I'm pretty sure his target is dorsal anterior cingulate as well. So somebody is trying to map it in, a, in an organized way uh, and not do it based on kind of these old cingulotomy studies. They, he he's actually has a, a study that's um, off the ground where they're using implanted depth electrodes, SEEG, to kind of map the circuit and tailoring the placement of, of the electrodes to target pain in these patients. So. It's um, area of active research, but absolutely, it's, ha it's happening. Interesting, I'll have to look those up, thank you. Yeah, sure, I can send you his contact info. Um, Dr. Tomasovic, I have a question. Hi, Clementine. Hi, um, thank you for um, this awesome presentation. Uh, sure. My question actually, yes, my question actually has two folds. So the first one is, um, I was curious to know for procedures like the um, chordotomy, mm -hmm. um, in your experience, what is usually the rate of pain recurrence in patients who have that procedure, especially because, you know, I mean, it's um, yeah. you know, in a patient setting. Mm -hmm. And then the other, I was curious to know, uh, what are the common complications that they, or the, you know, well, the common complications at the report um, post-operatively. Thank you. Yeah, so in, in my experience, I'll, I'll answer the complication one first. Ataxia was, was what I've seen in the patients that I've performed cardotomy on um, it, during fellowship. There's transient ataxia. Vital signs usually are finding you, you're monitoring vital signs and you're monitoring blood pressure with an A-line through the case. So I haven't seen these wild fluctuations in, in, in um, 
sort of homeostasis, uh, but transient ataxia is, the, is probably the biggest personal, if you want to call it complication, but it, it's transient, so it goes away. The patients are able to walk out of the hospital, but they're a little unsteady at first. Um, in terms of pain recurrence, you know, unfortunately, my fellowship is only 13 months, so I haven't been able to follow these patients um, longer than that. Oftentimes, um, these patients life expectancy is shorter than 13 months. So I don't have a great concrete number for you in terms of um, recurrent pain recurrence rate. I, I can certainly look it up. It's probably buried in a lot of these uh, studies, uh, especially that 2019 randomized controlled trial I talked about. I know it's a minority of patients, but, I, but I'm, I think it's a hard thing to track because often these patients um, tend to, to, to die. Pretty, pretty, you know, not too far after their cordotomy. It's a, these are palliative procedures. I hope that answered your question. I'm sorry if it's unsatisfactory. It does. It does. Thank you. I, I think it just comes across as you know, procedure to improve the quality of life in their That's right. That's last right. each days. So. That's right. That's right. That's right. And it's it's really um, you know, it, neurosurgery can be a pretty hairy a hairy profession, and it's it's a um. It's nice when you can do that for a patient, you know, bring them some relief. But it, it, it's just, it's a, it's the best, it's the best, it's the best, it's like the best feeling. <laughs> hello, I have a related question. Um, Hi, Jared. Like, hello. Um, you mentioned like the five criteria at the end that need to happen to kind yeah. of have procedures, which makes it seem like it's more of like a last resort thing. Um, but you also mentioned that I think the study in um, Israel mm -hmm. um, had that some patients who were bedridden that after the surgery were actually able to like, walk in. So has there been any push at all to get these procedures to be not just end of life or close to end of life procedures? Or has it kind of just remained like- No, no, de definitely, definitely. That's, that's a great question. So all the things I talked about today were in the context of refractory cancer pain. The vast majority of the uh, neuromodulatory procedures and the, the, what Ashlyn said, the anterior cingulate stimulation are in patients with just chronic pain and, and that, that fit this criteria of like a, a significant psychological component. They're emotionally just wrecked by their pain. Um, and I'm not gonna get into types of pain they have, but you know, I, just recalling my patients um, during fellowship, um, you know, patients who were in motorcycle accidents who were, you know, plegic from T4 down, they had a T4 level. So they had complex pain and they also had a psychological component because they're wheelchair bound, you know, they, they can't walk anymore. So I would say the vast majority of, especially cingulotomy and, and DBS in the, in the court, in the anterior cingulate is for non-cancer pain. I just was talking about cancer pain today. It's a great question. Okay. Other, what was the first part of your question? I forget, hold on, um, it'll come to me. Um, da, 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 da. Was there, there was a first part, wasn't there? Um, it was kind of, no, it was just like mentioning like the five criteria that you oh, said, the five criteria, so it was yeah. all like related. So th those criteria are really geared, geared toward palliative care docs and, and, and pa uh, medicine doctors who manage pain patients to help them have a framework, you know, so that our procedures are not last resort, but that, that a referral to me isn't a, like a last minute thing when the patient has a week to live. If they can go through that checklist and be, okay, my patient's had radiation, my patients can't take any more opiates because they're, they're, they're so sick and nauseous. If they can go through that and, and, and are familiar with that checklist, then we're gonna see those patients sooner and be able to help more patients, you know? And it's, okay. it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank yeah, you. Totally. You're welcome. Guys, write down my email. Feel free to email me, uh, and I'm, I'm pretty responsive, so we can we can certainly talk offline. And I'm happy to you know answer up general questions about neurosurgery residency and just blah 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 blah, not just pain. <laughs> hey, Rob, thanks everyone for a great session, and thanks, Dr. Tomasowitz. You're was, welcome. Uh, definitely a, a departure from the usual in a good way. Good. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Well, God, good luck to everybody. Stay safe, okay? Have a good night. Okay, take care.